please note due to the nature of this video, there will be some language that is slightly different depending on your setting. Patient is used throughout, but obviously we understand that the word person is more commonly used in social care. As well with healthcare professional, we understand that health and social care professional is more appropriate. We hope that you enjoy the video and at the end there will be a case study as well as questions for you to work on. Hello, my name is Heike Schaefer. I'm the end of life care educator at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Kings Lynn and I've been asked to present to you um, a presentation about dementia and end of life care. The aim of this session is to gain a greater understanding of the needs of a person with dementia at the end of life, recognize dementia as a palliative condition and understand why early diagnosis is essential in treatment and future planning. Explore the unique ethical, legal and quality of life implications for the person affected by dementia and recognize the added impact of a dementia diagnosis in the person affected, the need for open conversation and documentation. We also swiftly go over respect documentation and dementia. Building blocks for quality end of life care are recognition. It's really important to early recognize that a patient might be potentially in, at the end of life, which um, we naturally see as the last 12 months of life. We need to have good conversations, communication and coordination, symptom control, a really good focus at the last few days of life, and also consider the bereavement for the people left behind. So just imagine, how would you feel? You're asleep in a chair and woken up by a person trying to undress you. You're in bed feeling sick and then wet the bed. You have to get to school to pick up your children, but people stop you. Try to get undressed, but your sleeves are soon up, your shirt is buttoned up and you cannot undo it. You want to go out, but the door is locked and somebody you don't know is telling you to sit down. These are real life situations that dementia patients find themselves in. And for them, it's a really, really hard thing to do. And this is why they sometimes react really aggressively and really distressed, because in their head, they need to do something quite specific. And we're kind of trying to keep them safe and prevent that. And there's a lot of distress in that. If you're looking at people generally with an incurable cancer, we know that there's a short period of decline because for most cancers, while they're receiving treatment, they're kind of of an even level, as you can see here. And then when the treatment no longer works, you can see this rapid decline that eventually will lead to death. Um, and specialist care input is really easy because we know when the, when the treatment stops and the decline happens that that is where palliative care comes into its own. For long-term limitations with intermittent serious epi episodes, it's a little bit different. So people generally will decline, have a drop where they will receive treatment, kind of pick up again, not quite as they were before, but the general decline is there. And it's normally over two to five years and then eventually there will be a drop in health and then it will lead to death. With dementia, we kind of call it prolonged dwindling. They're kind of plodding along, and it's with most frailty really. They're kind of plodding along, getting a little bit poorer, picking themselves up, but it's over a quite a long period, six to eight years, you see this dwindling down and it's really difficult to point to the moment where medical professionals will think we're coming to the last 12 months because people will pick up a little bit, drop off a little bit. So for there, the end of life diagnosis is even more complex. How we might know if someone with dementia is approaching end of life? Usually we would think it's around the moderate to severe stages of dementia. Triggers to consider would be unable to walk without assistance, urinary and fecal incontinence, no consistently meaningful conversations, 
unable to self-perform activities of daily living. Weight loss, pressure sores, three to four stage pressure sores, reduced oral intake, and a likelihood to get um, an aspiration pneumonia because the swallowing will obviously decline as well. Conversations, really important very early on in the diagnosis is to have conversations about respect, which we have now replaced. It's no longer the do not resuscitate orders, it's the respect. I will go into that a little bit later in more detail. Talk about the patient about they will have a lack of capacity at some point. Who would they want to make decisions on their behalf? Do they need a lasting power of attorney? Even if a couple is married, it doesn't mean automatically that their loved one will have the capacity and the legal ability to make decisions on their behalf. Have a legal power of attorney, ideally for health and for money. Write a will. Think about advanced decision to refuse treatment. All these conversations need to happen. And talk to them about what matters most. Also, we need to think about the coordination of care. The ambulance service, who will inevitably get involved when people at home start to struggle looking after their loved one. When people come into A&E, how can we make it for a dementia patient nice and safe to get into A&E without being really distressed? How are we dealing with dementia patients in the acute setting? How are we dealing with patients like that in the community, in nursing homes, when we care for them at home on the social services level? It really needs a lot of conversation to get it right for these people on their last bit of the journey. Let's look at the last days of life, the weight loss. Some, some patients have an incredible amount of pain because their muscles have contracted, they're lying in bed a lot, they're not moving a lot. They have breathlessness because quite likely they have an aspiration pneumonia, a lot of agitation, hydration, they're no longer eating or drinking, they're refusing to eat and drink, so hydration becomes quite a concern. Secretions because they might not be able to swallow anymore. Mouth care, it's really difficult sometimes with people patients with dementia to perform mouth care because it's it's quite some it's quite a threatening thing for people to perceive so it's really difficult they will have very dry skin so that's another point where we need to look out for things let's look at weight loss i think naturally the urge to feed and nourish people is quite an instinctive thing we have as a human being and it's really difficult not to try to do that. And then having a patient that refuses to eat and to drink or doesn't want it anymore, is really, really difficult for people. Also, they have a reduced ability to swallow. They're losing fat and muscle muscle. They get forgetful and loss of appetite. It's not a sign of neglect. We're not neglecting them, but we, can own, we cannot force feed. So we can only give them as much as they will let us have. Exclude the obvious. It could be a yeast infection in the mouth. It could be infected teeth. It could be mouth ulcers. These are all things to consider. Talk to the family about risk feeding. There is a possibility that patients can eat if they want to, and there is a likelihood that they will aspirate, as long as the family is aware of that. That is absolutely fine. Try to offer finger foods. If you've had the conversation before they got that unwell and you know their favorite foods, try that. They might have always loved ice lollies. Go with the ice lollies. If he has 15 a day, have, let him have 15 a day. Personally, I have given people 15 Snickers bars and they only sucked the chocolate out of it. They still got their calories in. Think about oral supplementation. Feeding tubes are quite questionable because it's quite an invasive procedure. If you do it via an NG tube, that's really traumatic. A PEC is quite an operation, and at the end of life, for a frail and elderly person, that is not really the way forward. Also, it brings another risk of aspiration. If agreement is not to intervene, stop weighing. What are you going to find out apart from the fact that the person is probably losing weight? But if we're not doing anything, do we need to put him through the trauma of dragging him onto a chair to be weighed every day? 
and also manage staff and relatives' expectations. Speak to the family. They do not have to force feed the patient. It is a natural progression of their illness and just give them all the support that you can. Also consider pain. What's the cause? Are they constipated? Is it the pressure sores? Assess the pain. Is it the mood? They're just very agitated and it can come across as pain. I've put down the pain assessment in advanced dementia. Um, I hope this can be enlarged a little bit more because I don't want to go into major detail about it. But you can basically score around the items of breathing, negative vocalization, facial expression, body language and consolability. And if you hit two points at everything, it, you come out to a score of 10 and that kind of gives a clear indication that we need to get other people involved to manage the pain at a very high level. Specialist palliative care, GP, specialist palliative care consultant, um, hospices are quite good for um, just an admission for symptom management and then for discharge if that's what the patient wants. But we can only assume what the patient wants if we've had that really good conversation at the beginning. Also, if you have to consider pain medication, start low, go slow, especially when they're opiate naive. You might end up looking after a lady that weighs 45 kilograms. The normal pain scale will cause her significant problems because it probably will be too much. So really, really think what you're giving initially. Start laxatives if you can, if you're giving opioids, because what you do not want to deal with is an opiate-induced constipation, and then we're in big trouble. Don't start a fentanyl patch or a pain patch in the last few days of life, because um, it takes a few days to reach a therapeutic level. If they already have a patch, that's brilliant. Keep using them and just put pain medication on top, and that generally works quite well. I know agitation and restlessness is a huge thing. There is an assessment chart that people are welcome to use and it's about agitation and restlessness. Rule of thumb, look for an underlying cause. What has changed? Is there any environmental or social causes, physical causes? And check off the health and well-being. Sometimes off the carer as well. If you're looking after somebody for a length of time, Agitation that might not be a lot to you and me, might be a lot to the carer because they've been exposed to it for a very long time. If there are no identifiable causes, is there a non-doc treatment? Trial a bit of pain relief. Seek specialist help and potentially try antipsychotic medication. So consider their normal habits. If a patient normally, historically, would get up at 10 o'clock and you try to get them at 6 o'clock, I wouldn't be happy and at the moment I don't have dementia and neither would probably be the dementia patient. Check for their general mood. Let them be who they are in their mood. Do not try to fight it. If you can help with the sleep, if they've had a good night's sleep, the likelihood is they make up a lot more relaxed and able to manage than normally. They might have hallucinations, antipsychotic drugs. Try music, try soothing therapies, gentle light. If they've always had a pet, see if you can get a plush toy that resembles the pet. If they were always very good with children, try introduce a doll. And it's almost something that might help them soothe because they feel they need to take responsibility because it's something in their very deep memory that they know how to do. And that might take away from the agitation. Hydration, it's a huge, huge issue with dementia because we, weigh, we have to weigh up that hydration-related symptoms, including thirst, can cause discomfort against the concern that overhydration can lead to pain and difficulty breathing from fluid retention. We need to remember that in the end stages of dementia, the body is trying to shut down. So kidneys will not work as well as they used to. So any amount of fluid that we give that would be considered normal might be too much for that patient. Studies of thirst and dying patients conclude that there's little relationship between artificial hydration and thirst. 
but oral hygiene and offering little sups of fluid administered for comfort can improve the thirst without having to fluid overload the patient. If it's in a care setting, mouth hygiene is a brilliant way to get the family involved because they feel they can do something and they can do something well and keep their patient comfortable. So just dish out a mouth tray with all the things that they need. Teach them how to do it and you will have people doing amazing, amazing mouth care, giving you a little bit time to do anything else. But they feel really empowered because they are able to do something and they're not just sitting at the bedside watching somebody slowly awaiting death. Concerned family and friends may be distressed that their loved one is experiencing thirst at the end of life, which can prompt requests for artificial nutrition or hydration. They should be considered, but artificial hydration is unlikely to alleviate thirst and comes with significant risks. This needs to be explained to the family. At the end of life, the patient is not dying because he's not eating and drinking. He's not eating and drinking because he's dying. And that's a very different thing. Why is dementia different to other conditions in death? It's not that obvious. There isn't a right point where we can say we're now definitely maybe in the last few days of life because the dwindling is so slow that it's really difficult to pinpoint. The trajectory is different. The patient's needs are complex and often very challenging. There isn't much research around yet how to do this properly and give it certain statistics that make sense in the wider care way. And our own anxieties as health professionals come into that as well. It's quite a challenging thing to look after somebody with dementia because they react in a different way. It's not always manageable. We feel we're losing control. We feel we need to do something and we're not getting the right thing. We feel we have a list of things that we need to be doing and he's not really doing what we want him to do. And I think it's about stepping away and making the most of what you can do and letting go of the things you can't. Because the more you push, the more you create an agitation agitate a patient that might fight you or might get really angry because they're just in a very different world. Let's talk about respect. Um, respect came into place in 2020 in Norfolk. Um, it's the recommended summary plan for emergency care and treatment. It has replaced all DNR forms. So if you still have the DNR forms with a red frame around it, they are still valid, but if they need to be reviewed, then it should really be the respect document that is used. The idea is that it is a process that creates a personalized recommendation for each patient. Obviously, it's for future emergencies in which they are unable to make or express choices. So for dementia patients that have might have had a diagnosis two years ago, ideally that respect document should have been discussed when they still had capacity. Because when we come to the point where they no longer have capacity, that discussion is going to be very different. And then we have to talk to families who might have their own views, their own guilt, their own stresses, and it becomes far more of a complex um, task to do. It provides healthcare professionals responding to that emergency with a summary of recommendations to help them make immediate decisions. As I said, it replaces the hospital and community do not resuscitate forms. And it's a living document owned by the patient. At any given point, they can go and see their consultant and their GP and ask for it to be reviewed and to be filled in collaboratively. And they can change their mind. In the end, like with the DNAR form, it's a medical decision to perform DNAR, to perform CPR, but they have some more input in it and it also gives other clinicians a little bit more of an insight what the patient's preferences would be. The key stages of the respect process are to understand, to establish a shared understanding of the person's state of health and medical conditions and what they might reasonably expect in terms of progressive deterioration, abrupt health crisis, 
a longevity. So it is an invitation for a physician with the patient to really in depth discuss their illness, their dementia, what the likelihood of the outcome is, what the time frame is and what the likely symptoms are so that a patient can make a really informed decision about what's important to them, what they still need to achieve and what their preferred way of treatment is. It sets goals to establish what is important to the person, what they see as the main focus of their care and treatment and balance between sustaining life and maximizing comfort. And then the third thing is to plan to discuss the treatments that should be considered. If you at the end of life and you have a chest infection, do you want to go back to hospital every two weeks and receive antibiotics? Or do you want to be quite clearly be at home and we have to discuss with your GP all antibiotics? These are the kind of conversations we need to have. And though respect is not legally binding, the rec recommendations made must be considered when making decisions about the person's care and treatment. And we also obviously need to draw on other legally binding documents if they, ha if they have an advanced decision to refuse treatment. It really takes a change of culture to think about emergency care planning in this way. And I think we're far way off having it properly embedded but I would really encourage everybody to have a look at the form and to think what would be important to you if that was you and what you would want written down and then think about what the people you look after might want. Capacity. Capacity and or capacity assessment or lack of capacity is an impairment of or disturbance in the functioning of the mind or brain which affects decision-making ability. Don't discriminate because somebody is old, how they appear, or make assumptions about their condition or any aspect of their behavior. People that are reasonably old, have a peculiar appearance, might still have the capacity to make decisions. And if these decisions do not agree with you and they have capacity, that's still their agreed decision and we have to abide by this. Also having capacity encompasses the ability to understand the information relevant to the decision, to retain the information relevant to the decision, to use away the information and to communicate the decision. If a patient or somebody you care for fail on one or more of these above, they lack capacity. And it's again a situation that might have to happen with a dementia patient various times during the day because if they had a good night's sleep and wake up in the morning they might still have a level of capacity but as we're going through the day, the sundowning as we're calling it sometimes, they might then lack the capacity. So it is not a one step, do it once and we've decided you haven't got capacity, keep going with it. Every time you want to perform a wash or need to do anything with the patient or ask for a decision, really think of these four points and check if they're still in the position to make an informed decision and have the capacity to do so. Our role as where people working in the caring profession is, rather than having nothing else to offer, End-of-life care actually is a busy and active phase of care. The focus shifts from seeking to cure to enable all that's still possible. And we only get to do it once. You're not going to make a do-over. Once this person has died, we have lost every chance to make it better. So we have to do it well the first time around. And palliative care is everyone's role. It is not a designated person. Everybody needs to chip in. Our first question from providers is, any practical advice on managing behaviours within end-of-life care plans for people living with dementia? Well, we've kind of, kind of covered this a little bit already in the presentation. It's really about 
look at the person, look at, make it an individualized care. If they've always had a hobby that they were really fond of, always had a pet, were really into children and nurturing, get some dolls and get some toys and just something they can relate to. If it's more of a confusion where they're going, um, I've known from nursing homes that put pictures of the patient um, at their particular age when they were 20, 25, because they recognize themselves then. And that will solve a lot of the confusion and agitation. I think some of it will always be medication driven because sometimes with the best in the world, you will not find the reason why they're agitated. And you might have to you know, get your hand into the pocket of pharmaceuticals, but also look at what the patient likes. Do they like music? Do they like soft furnishings? Do they like, um, I think in Kingston we have twiddle mitts as well, where there is um, a knitted round with buttons and pockets where people just like to play with. And sometimes it does really soothe and that seems to help. Our second question is, are respect forms taking the place of DNARs or are they working alongside each other? They no longer work alongside. As I said in the presentation, if you still have a valid um, do not resuscitate form with the red frame around it, you're absolutely within your rights to use it. If the DNA needs to be reviewed, then the respect form should be used because that's the way we are going. And it's also to encourage medical staff to have these conversations with these patients about what they would like, give them an explanation about what the future is going to look like and also have the family involved because I think these conversations do not happen as frequently as they should, then it becomes really stressful. And if the family is stressful, the relative is going to be more stressed and then it becomes this agitated situation and then it becomes difficult to manage. I think it's very person specific, but I also think if there's significant changes in the patient, then maybe it's worth talking to the family as well because things might change. If, if they initially still wanted to have a CPR and intensive care admission, I think there comes a point where that's no longer appropriate. So then the family can also discuss it with the patient's physician. Please now use the following case study to apply your learning. Norman is 82 and has vascular dementia and heart failure. He was living alone with a package of care from four regular carers until he was transferred to a care home four months ago following admission to hospital due to a fall. During the admission, his mobility declined and he became more distressed, voicing his wish not to be left in a hospital bed to die, like his late wife Rose. It was decided that he should move to a care home as the carers had been struggling to meet his needs before his decline, despite going above and beyond and trying to keep him at home. Since arriving in the care home, Norman has deteriorated further. He has lost a lot of weight and he has had a UTI and a further two brief hospital admissions as a result of a chest infection. He has no family and the only visitors are two of the carers, Louise and Jeff, who supported him at home. One Friday night, he appears to be unwell again. The care home staff do not feel the hospital is the best place for him, as during the last hospital admission, he became distressed. However, as he has a high temperature and hasn't passed urine for some time, the care home staff are duty bound to call for medical. They call 111, who send out an ambulance, and as there is no anticipatory or advanced care plan in place, and they have limited access to his medical notes, the paramedics feel obliged to take him into hospital. Sadly, Norman dies three days later in hospital. Louise and Jeff, alongside the care home staff, feel saddened that he died in hospital without familiar people around him, given his wish not to die in hospital. Please consider the following questions when applying your own learning. What could have been done differently? How might ACP have helped? What are the signs that someone with dementia might be coming to the end of their life? When people with advanced dementia struggle to swallow, how can we get them to eat and drink? Can a person with dementia participate in ACP? What rights do families have in making decisions about a person at the end of life? How can I, as a carer, challenge health professionals when I know something is wrong? Thank you for watching. If you would like more information, please visit norfolkandsuffolkcaresupport.co.uk where you'll find further training on our learning portal.
The link for this website is in the description down below.